1997, a racing simulation video game was released on the first iteration of Sony's PlayStation. The game was wildly popular and spawned many sequels and spinoffs and sold over 90 million units since its debut. One important adaptation of the game is the formation of the GT Academy, which aimed to make professional racers out of gamers who logged thousands of hours playing Gran Turismo. I'm Ronald Young Jr. and I'm leaving the theater. This is Ronald, and I am leaving the theater after seeing Gran Turismo. Gran Turismo, written by Jason Hall and Zach Balin, directed by Neil Blomkamp, starring Archie Medeque, David Harbour, Orlando Bloom, Damon Barnett, Jerry Halliwell Horner, and Jimon Hutsu. And for a complete cast listing, you can check out the link in our show notes. I am not here alone. Standing next to me, seething in rage, is Chioki Ianson. Chioki Ianson of VCU, <laughs> of a lot of places. We'll, we'll plug some stuff later. But Gran Turismo is a movie about the racing simulation game. Some people call it a video game uh, that was made for PlayStation in which you are racing cars. And it is known to be one of the greatest racing simulators uh, ever made. And it's marketed as a video game. Well, one day, these guys decided to see if these simulation racers could actually do it in the real world. And this is the story of one of those racers who actually crossed over from simulation racing to real racing. And the movie ensues. Chioke, Ayudele, Ayansen, what did you think of this movie? I like racing. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm already. I'm sorry. I like underdog tales. Okay. I like video games. Okay. Why did none of that really happen in this movie? Did it not happen or did it? Tell, tell me. Say more. Okay. This movie cares about none of the things that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. It only cares about the surface iconography yes. of the Gran Turismo video game. Correct. The truth of this movie is that it's a marketing exercise. And it actually kind of makes sense. Because if you look at how much uh, sales of a video game like Gran Turismo, like what it makes, it's many times over what it would cost to make this movie, right? This is very true. And so they released this movie. I can only imagine that there's like a Gran Turismo update or like a new game coming out or whatever. And so this movie is just doing the job of the marketing for the video game. That's all this movie is doing. I agree with you. I think that now and now that you're actually explaining it, I realize that's what what's happening is I'm being sold Gran Turismo the game and I'm being sold a dream with the game saying that if I get good enough at the simulator then I too can be a racer which it, I don't appreciate now that you said that and it kind of makes sense because if the goal was simply for there to be this one-to-one -one, uh like uh impersonation or like substitution right so like that that object on the screen is you yeah and that explains why our main characters have no personality or characterization. It's very true. Uh, there was. It's funny because I think this movie thinks it's doing the work of character development. And it's really just kind of uh, very predictable and known tropes disguised as character development. Because when I get to the end of the movie, there's emotional things happening. And I my brain understands why the emotion is happening, but my emotions feel absolutely nothing. I'm thinking about my own father, of course, because there's a father and son tale here. And I'm thinking, oh, I love my dad, but I'm not crying. I'm not, I didn't even tear up 
dry as a bone. I, I'm the first cat to cry at, a, at like a father narrative. Yeah. Nope. Not happening here. Not even a little. This movie has no subtext. Yeah. The okay, you have to y'all have to imagine this opening scene where a kid is playing the video game at home. First off, he has every Gran Turismo game. Every single one. That means that he played PlayStation 1. Correct. PlayStation 2. 2. PlayStation 3. This, 3. This kid is 17 years old. <laughs> the PS1 wasn't it, like <laughs> he was not born. Okay. Yeah. Fine. The, the dad walks in holding a soccer ball yep. and is like, hey, kid, let's go play some soccer. You can get out of the house. No, dad. You know that I don't like soccer. Oh, my God. Okay. Well, okay, fine. I guess that now we understand what the stakes are. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's also like it's also one of those things where I, I could tell what the movie was doing and it was very annoying. It's almost like if somebody comes and taps you on the left shoulder trying to get you to look left. Like, like reaches around you and taps. I feel like the movie was doing that a lot. And this was one of those instances when I'm just like, this is painfully obvious what y'all are trying to create here. But I got to be honest with you, is if, if his father supported him the whole time, it would still be incredible that this man went from playing video games to actually racing in the streets. So I don't really need that much more conflict except the, fe- except the conflict of the actual thing that he did, which is pretty incredible. Also... I don't understand what the father was even up to. Like at one point he takes uh, the dad takes the the kid to his job and is teaching them a job and he's like, "Okay dad, I get it, you know, how long do I have to work here? I'll pay for the thing that I broke." And the dad is like, "This isn't about that. This is about this is where you end up when you don't have a life plan." And I'm like, "A good job with benefits that you can have like a very nice house on? What it, like what's the, where's the downside here, pops?" There's really no, uh, and there's not enough character development with the dad for us to really look and understand why the dad would consider one himself to be a failure or to consider what his son is doing to be failure. The other thing is we don't know how old this child, this person is. We know they started at university and didn't finish. So we know that they're somewhere between the ages of 18 and 22, but the movie never kind of explicitly states this. It also adds in a love interest that I am not interested in whatsoever. Like they added this, they just glommed that on there. And I didn't understand why that was in there. Well, that was the first sign that something was drastic wrong because we this whole movie does a thing where the information that you would need beforehand to have some interest in what happens subsequently does not take place they only tell you the information as it comes up so that that way you can not care about anything that's happening at all and the first sign was the girlfriend because they they mention her like to to get him out of the house and they mention her name and then he's like, oh, well, in that case, I'll go. And I'm like, I don't know who this girl is or why you want to. I don't know what is happening here. And then their relationship is great. Like it never it's not like, oh, I'm a little bit awkward and I'm not sure. It's not like I don't have the self-confidence to like ask this girl out. It's, it's none of that. Their relationship starts fine, ends fine. It has no arc. Yeah. It, it is, as a matter of fact, her only job is to just be girlfriend in a way that I have not seen in a film like in 2023 and a long time where it's like, what, what, what was her use besides just being his girlfriend? Oh yeah, no, you're right. This is like a, um, this is like a, a Bechdel test negative fail. Yeah. 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 No, no. Agreed. So l- there's one thing I was thinking throughout the movie and we'll, we'll get to the racing of it all in a second. But the one thing I was thinking about this was I think the biggest fail was that this probably should have been a streaming series. And I think had it been a streaming series, they would have been able to do a lot more with what they tried to jam into maybe two hours or less just now. Because I'm thinking if you think about the emotional beats from him doing being a racer, being in his parents' house to having that little racing scene in the beginning where he has to outrun the cops. And then like, you know, like as you move on to him transitioning into racing and the montages that they put in there to show that time is passing, like all of that, it seems like this would have been probably a lot better if if it was over eight episodes and they actually had time to like develop an arc and make me actually care and all that i would say if it was eight 15 minute episodes <laughs> i think they could probably do it in 40 minutes an episode no 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 it need 15 minutes first off the that the so okay so at one point our hero decides to run from the cops and he makes it and I'm like, well, then what's the 
problem. Like this is the kind of thing where you try it and then you fail and it becomes a big issue and then they bail you out and then you go to the thing. And like, so, but the whole point is that anything that maybe would have been an impediment to progress completely evaporates. Correct. At any moment during the movie, nothing, no, there's no stakes to anything uh, whatsoever. And that hurts the rate. Well, many things hurt the racing. But the fact that none of the stakes are, like, outlined and none of the, like, there's no, nothing sets you up to be like a will they, won't they, will it happen drama. There's nothing there. It was very much like a Harry Potter book where it's like a fixed point. Like, you already know where the author's going. Like, when they get to, a lot of people complained about this in the seventh book, where it's like, they knew where they were going. And every side quest that happened, you're just like, these aren't really side quests. We know Harry's going to win. Like, where's this going? And I think this was the exact same problem, where there was no really risk of them not accomplishing the goals that they stated. Like, if you've seen the preview, then you know that him having to rush to make the entry race into the academy, you know that that's a red, you know that's just not true. You know it doesn't matter. If you've seen... Any parts of the movie, you know that eventually he is going to be into a race car. He is going to be racing other people. So it's like, why Why are you like trying to add bits of conflicts to fix points when there's no real conflict here? And I think, I mean, that's why I'm saying like maybe if they had more time to flesh it out, they could actually convince me that this guy wasn't going to make it or make it about all of the Academy members instead of just one of them. The idea of all the Academy members makes sense to me, but I don't think it's about more time. I think it's just about better writing. I mean, I think this movie, it could have happened in 90 minutes. I don't know how long it was, but it felt very long. There was about two hours. That's too long. It was way too long. Yeah, that's too long. If it was just written better, yeah. then it could have been better. And so there's two things that it needed to do. It needed to be entertaining enough to have us watch the racing, and then it needed to have good racing. It did not have good racing. Here's the thing. I think you're wrong about that, though. And I'll tell you why. Because to a standard moviegoer myself, and when I say to a standard, and I mean, like, I will critique a movie up and down. But just as a person sitting there, even though I was hating the movie at the same time as you were, when I was watching the racing, I held my breath a few times. And it was enough for me to be like, man, I don't know what's happening, but, man, I hope he makes it around this turn in a way that I think that you, because you know racing more, it probably mattered less to you. I think that that's true. I think that, I mean, I wondered what other people thought of it as I watched it. But for me, I was like, okay, you're just showing me Michael Bay style clips of things put together. And there isn't any coherent narrative of what the race is or how to do racing. And so at any given moment, I, I wanted them to explain a bit about what happens at the track and what it means when you pull up alongside and show them a wheel and they have to yield and what some of the rules were so that then when the racing happened, the drama could bounce up against the rules. That's too much. Because what everything you're explaining, because I'm thinking what they explained to me was enough for me to keep in my head. Like, hey, we got to go around. We have to keep our line. And so when it's showing the line on the screen, it's using that as those video game aspects to kind of show them cutting in inside and outside each other. The fact that they're using the animations on top to say first, second, third is enough for me to keep up with. And you know I watch movies. And if I'm watching that and saying this is enough, if you're telling me about showing me the wheel and like what, like all that other stuff, I'm like, I don't see how you fit that in for an average moviegoer. Okay, Days of Thunder is a... You ever know this movie? It's a old. movie I've never seen with Tom Cruise. It's a movie you've never seen with Tom Cruise. They're racing just ovals, and it's good because there's... First off, there's drama between the drivers, and they describe the rules good enough that when anything happens, you find it exciting. But it circles, dog. No, no, no. Go back to, go back to Ghostbusters, Okay. Uh, what happens if you cross the streams, right? He asks, Bill Murray asks. Yeah. And Egon is like, you don't want to cross the streams, yeah. right? That just, that simple moment is enough to let us know that, oh, if this thing happens, then something bad might take place. Yeah, right? but they did that. And that's they the, that's the not- scene. No, they did. They That's the scene I turned to you and said, we already knew that. There's a scene where he's practicing something early in the movie yeah. that we know is going to come up later in the movie. That was their thing. I'm saying, I'm saying to you as a racing enthusiast that your complexity, your knowledge of racing is actually a disadvantage watching this movie. So I... I agree that that is possible. 
I'm However, not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying you're, you're at a disadvantage. No, I mean, no, I, I I agree that, you know, anyone that has expertise about the thing that's in the movie, it's like yeah. how, like, astronauts can't watch Star Trek and, and that whole thing. It's like Nick Hill can't watch Creed 3 without being like, come on, you can't be doing round one things in round 12. Yeah, okay, so, I mean, so I, I, I take that point. I just think that there was a lot of opportunity to explain small things that could have made the dramatic impact a lot greater. They do regular races the entire movie, and then at the very end, they do a 24-hour endurance race. Mm -hmm. And at no point, like, okay, the David Harbour's character is like, oh, I, I raced Le Mans, and it broke me, and the whole thing. And I'm like, okay, all right. I mean, you know, Le Mans in a tough track. But he was talking about the 24 hours of Le Mans, right? And that is an endurance race. Like, the rules are different. Things are crazy. Here's the thing. I think that if you're like the complexity that you are asking for this movie to add, you are risking at this point, movie watchers, to now be disengaged for a different reason. I'm not asking for complexity. No, no, no. But I'm saying, I'm saying like, think about what was already there and think about what you're asking it to add. You're saying more little simple things for the viewer to keep in mind about racing around the track. Now, the things that they already told them was the line. The placement, because as a viewer, what, what, what's the most important thing for you to know? The line, the placement of the car, how fast things are going, okay. and if there's any danger. No. I mean, that's basically it. Okay, all right. You're okay. arguing racing now. I want to be clear. You're not, not arguing the movie. You're listen, arguing I'm racing. Not try, I'm not arguing racing. <laughs> I'm just saying that in terms of dramatic effects, there are some things that they could have said ahead of time uh -huh. that would have given us more drama later. That's I, all that I'm saying. I agree with that. And I think they did that. I think that your racing knowledge is putting you at a disadvantage <laughs> here. Because I think you're saying if they would have told them more about, like, the purple nurple and the flirk, 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 flirk then they would have known. <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I understand yeah. what you're saying. I'm just saying, like, you wanted more of that information as a person who knows that information. I'm telling you as a person who does not know that information, if you tell me that they were going to give me more racing information, I would have been like, let me tell you something. Not only was it trophy, now I had to know all this stuff about racing. Well, so this is what's a trip, right? Is that like, I want to imagine that someone who plays Gran Turismo or who likes racing would go to this movie and like it. But I, but that can't possibly be true. But they're not trying to sell them the game. Oh, so you're saying that like this. Okay, so, all right. So that, that actually makes sense. So yeah. what you're saying is that this movie is an active act of contempt against anyone who does know anything about racing or Gran Turismo. No, I'm saying that this movie is an active act of contempt against anyone who knows about racing and Gran Turismo, but it's not necessarily intentionally. You know what I mean? It is actively <laughs> like hostile and contemptuous, but I don't think it does so on purpose. I think what it's actually trying to do is sell racing and racing games to people that would otherwise... You know what I'm saying? Like, people that would otherwise not buy the game. Now, we're, we're getting oh, too deep into the weeds. No, 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 no. But, no but it's a good point. So, so you're saying that the fact that I like racing, the fact yes. that I like video games, yes. and the fact that I like underdog stories disqualifies me from the target audience for this movie. I'm saying that it does, only the first two, not the last one. Liking underdog stories, all that stuff's great. They want you in the theater. What they don't care about is anyone who really actually is a racing fan and other people that are, are – that are, that are fans of the game. Like they'll give those, they'll give people fan service that played Gran Turismo for years that are like, oh my God, so many cool things are happening in the movie while I'm watching it. But what they're not giving grace to is anybody who knows about racing, knows all the little things. They they don't care about y'all. Matter of fact, they don't want y'all in there because you'll do this. Even though I'm telling you as a like an average, like that knows just enough that I'm also not appreciating. Now, with all that being said, I need to know your rating. Oh no, we do ratings on this show. Yeah. Uh, it's a five stars. This movie gets one and a half stars. And the half star is for Enya and Kenny G. <laughs> okay. I I give this movie two stars. I think that this is a two star movie. Uh, I think it it actually had two point five and three star moments uh, in there, but unfortunately the rest of the movie was very much one star uh, in terms of what they were trying to accomplish. So it only rises to about two for me. I think 1.5 is a fair rating. I expected you to say one. Uh, so I'm not, I, that, like, that doesn't surprise me whatsoever. 
I'm not done complaining about this movie. We are. We don't have time. Neil Blomkamp <laughs> directed this movie. I will say that that was a surprise to you and me both. When we saw that at the end, it was like we were betrayed. When I was I was watching the movie from the first scene, and I was like, oh, like some kid who used to direct music videos. This is their first movie, mm. or like you know whatever. I, I was like, this is somebody's first thing, and and that's fine because they got him for cheap. And then I saw Neil Blomkamp, and I was like. Oh, well, I don't know what the world is. This movie had perhaps the worst editing that I've seen in a very long time. Pacing was bad. There are moments in this movie. Okay, so first You off, have to wrap it up. There are... Okay, characters appear, and there are lower thirds intros to the character. And then not a minute later, a character will sh- walk up to a person and say, Oh, hey, I'm the person from the lower thirds intro. <laughs> and I'm like, what is going on? Yeah, this was... I think that... I, I think generally... I don't think Neil Blomkamp makes good movies. Uh, and actually, if you look at his, and like, and Google him right now, if you don't believe me, and then look at his Rotten Tomato scores. I watched Elysium the other day, and wow, what a trash movie that like seemed like a good preview. So it's not surprising that this movie isn't good. Now, before I let you go, do you have anything you want to plug? I would like all of you <laughs> to come to Resonate Podcast Festival, November 3rd and 4th in Richmond, Virginia. ResonatePodFest.com. DM Ronald for a discount code. Yeah, come to me. I got a discount code. I'll also be giving a presentation there on vulnerable storytelling, which I'm very excited about. I get to talk more about the creation and making of Wait For It. So for those of you that have been interested in the show, you should definitely come out and check that out. I will give you 30 seconds to make one last complaint before I cut to credits. You have 30 seconds starting now. The next time Nick Hill... Uh, goes to see a movie, or when you think, oh, I'm going to bring Nick to this movie, don't take Nick. Take me instead, and then take (laughs) Nick to the movie that you would take me to. Do that. Four-hour round trip, Ronald. That's how much I have to drive to watch a movie with you. You know what? I will say the one movie that you had to drive the least for was also a terrible movie. It was Avatar The Way of Water. So I'm just saying... And you made me and Nick and my daughter watch that. I didn't make Amaya go. Amaya was so mad. (laughs) Okay, well, and with that, Leave It in Theater is a production of Owens Big Rod Studios. Alexandra Ketch of Bias Studios mixes the show. Thank you, Alex. Show art from Heather Wilder. Theme music by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. For more information about Gran Turismo or Chioke Ayansen, check out our show notes. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Threads, and TikTok at Owens oh, Big Ron. That's at O-H-I-T-S-B-I-G-R-O-N. You can find out more about this show and other Owens oh, Big Ron Studio shows by following us on Instagram at Owens oh, Big Ron Studios and on Twitter at Oh, it's Big Ron Stew. That's S T E W. Leaving the theater will be back soon. Thanks for listening. And thanks for being on the show. Oh, you're so welcome, Ronald. Yeah. Yeah, I carry a bag all the time. No. So, like a purse? Yeah, like a purse. No, I don't But bigger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This movie details the time, man. That lady was really interested in what I was saying. <laughs> oh, y'all missed it. This lady came by and just gave me the look. Uh, okay.